Hey everyone, my name is Nick Wignall. I'm a clinical psychologist and the founder of The Friendly Mind, a free weekly newsletter where I share practical, evidence-based advice for emotional health and well-being. Today, I'm going to talk about anxiety, specifically how you can get better at supporting a friend or a loved one who struggles with anxiety. Now, helping someone with anxiety can be frustrating, as I'm sure you know. Our advice maybe doesn't get uh, listened to or maybe even gets criticized when we try and give advice. Or we just, you know, we give a lot of sympathy and support, but in the long run, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. And then, of course, you know, just being around highly anxious people a lot can be hard. It's not their fault, but it's just tough being around people who are really anxious, right? It can be kind of stressful and discouraging. Um, It can even make us kind of anxious. So there are lots of perfectly valid reasons why it can be really difficult um, to help highly anxious people. And I, you know, I have a lot of firsthand experience with this. I'm a psychologist and I specialize in working primarily with anxious folks. So I've spent um, years and years of my life, many hours a day, five days a week, um, sitting with anxious people talking about their anxiety. And all those concerns, those are valid. It, It is tough in some ways, but in a lot of ways, supporting anxious people for many people is tougher than it needs to be because understandably, a lot of us aren't taught how to think really carefully about anxiety and what it is and how it works and therefore how best to support someone who struggles with it. So I want to explain why, you know, working with or trying to support people with anxiety can be especially tough because, and this is true both for the people struggling with anxiety and for the people trying to support them, um, anxiety is what I call a paradoxical problem. And what that means is often the harder you try to help with anxiety, the worse it gets. It's a very strange phenomena, but it comes from the fact that we don't actually, we don't understand anxiety very well. And it's a very counterintuitive process or sort of system. And so in today's video, what I want to do is I want to teach you how to think about anxiety like a professional psychologist so that you can approach helping someone with anxiety um, in a way that's more effective, both for them and their anxiety, but also for you as a, um, as a helper and a support person. So in the rest of this video, I'm going to walk you through three counterintuitive, but very effective ways to be a better support person for someone in your life who struggles with anxiety. All right, let's dive in. Number one, manage your own anxiety first. Now this one can be a little tough to hear, so brace yourself, but the biggest obstacle to you supporting someone with anxiety is your own anxiety. So yes, what this means is you have anxiety, Now, it doesn't mean you have clinical anxiety or that you have chronic anxiety or that even you have very much anxiety in general, but I guarantee if there's someone in your life who you love or really care about and they are suffering with anything, but especially with anxiety, you are going to feel some anxiety about being around them and their anxiety and being in this role of trying to help them. That's totally normal and understandable. So you are going to feel some anxiety even if you're not aware of it all the time. And as someone who doesn't get anxious very much, if you're the kind of person who isn't typically a very anxious person, it would also make sense that you're not necessarily especially good at um, being aware of or attuned to moments when you're feeling really anxious. I know this was definitely true for me. I am generally not a particularly anxious person. It's not something I struggle with very much. But when I was first starting off as a therapist in graduate school training, I was working with a lot of clients who were anxious. And during my supervision sessions with, um, you know, my mentors and supervisors, people who were helping me learn how to be a better therapist, they tended to, all of them tended to point out the same thing, which were, they would say things like, you're being really impatient or you need to slow down. You need to relax, give them a little bit of time, give the session some space, things like this. And what they were getting at that I wasn't attuned to at that particular time was that my impatience, the sense of kind of rushing a little bit, that was a symptom of a more underlying problem, which in my case was anxiety. And even though I wasn't a particularly anxious person, I was, especially once I started looking for it, I was anxious about my own ability to help my clients who were getting anxious. So I was getting anxious in sessions, but I wasn't realizing it. And it was coming out as impatience. And that impatience was obviously getting in the way of me being able to be helpful to my clients who were struggling with anxiety. Now, once I realized that and became more self-aware of that anxiety, 
I was able to a large extent to um, deal with it much better and to not let that come out as impatience. And I think um, both me and my clients really <laughs> benefited from me becoming more aware of that anxiety. So if you are supporting someone or trying to help someone with anxiety, and especially if you're not the kind of person who typically gets anxious, it's important that you develop the skill of noticing and being aware of when you are getting anxious. And there are a few particular kind of signs or signals you can watch out for. The first one is the one I already described with myself, and that is impatience. So if you find yourself frequently getting frustrated or impatient, um, in particular with this person you're trying to help who struggles with anxiety, that again could be a symptom of your own anxiety. You're worried or afraid um, potentially that you're not being helpful or you're not being helpful fast enough or quick enough. And so the way we deal with that is we try to make things happen faster. We start rushing things. We get impatient. And it's it's all very well-intentioned. It's not you're trying to do something wrong. But the way that comes across to the person you're trying to help is that you seem frustrated and they start to seem like an obstacle, like a problem. And that really doesn't feel good and tends to exacerbate anxiety. So you definitely want to watch out for, um, for impatience in particular. The other thing that's helpful to keep an eye out for, number two, is talking a lot. <laughs> so uh, this is another thing that happens when we're feeling anxious, and especially if we don't realize that we're feeling anxious, is a lot of us have this tendency in interpersonal situations in particular to use talkativeness as a coping mechanism for anxiety. We feel anxious, and so we there's this pressure inside to do something. And one of the ways we do something is we start chatting more and more. And again, this can be problematic if you're trying to support or help someone with anxiety because a lot of people who struggle with anxiety, one of the reasons they struggle with anxiety is they have a hard time being um, assertive and they tend to be kind of passive, especially in interpersonal situations. And if you are unwittingly kind of dominating the conversation by being extra chatty because you're really just trying to cope with your own anxiety about not being able to help this person who has anxiety, that can end up reinforcing some pretty unhelpful patterns in the person with anxiety. So you definitely want to watch out for that. And then the last one is number three, advice giving. Now this one is, you know, it's so natural. It's so understandable. You're trying to help. And one of the ways we help people is we give advice. And often our advice really is good. It's very, it could be very helpful. The problem with this is advice isn't always what anxious people need. In fact, a lot of the times people who are anxious, they basically know what they should do or what they should stop doing, but they're struggling with it. They're having a hard time doing it. So the mistake on our part as support people is to assume that more information or advice is really the thing that they need. In reality, what they probably need is more confidence to do the things they know they need to do. And one of the best ways to build confidence, kind of paradoxically, is to stop giving advice and instead to focus on connection, just being present and available instead of kind of stuffing them with information <laughs> as well-intentioned as that might be. And we'll talk more about this, this idea of being present and validating in particular. Um, but yeah, you wanna watch out for lots of advice giving. If you find yourself giving tons of advice and it not really working, that could be symptomatic of you trying to kind of cover up for or deal with your own anxiety. Now, as you probably sort of notice, these three kind of symptoms, what they all have in common is, <clears throat> if you think about it, and I don't want this to sound judgmental, I mean, we all fall into this as, as people who are trying to support other people with anxiety, but what they all have in common is, unintentionally, <laughs> what we're doing is not actually about helping the anxious person, it's about helping ourselves deal with our own anxiety. So when you have anxiety, trying to support an anxious person, your behavior unintentionally gets geared toward yourself and away from the person you're actually trying to help. So it's not surprising that we are not nearly as effective as we would like to be or we would think we would be with other people because sort of unconsciously, what we're really aiming at is addressing our own stuff, our own anxiety. <laughs> um, on the other hand, if you get good at identifying and managing your anxiety, it frees you up to put all of your energy and bandwidth uh, more productively onto the actual person who, who needs your help. So the best way to do this, there, there's really two steps. The first is you want to practice simply acknowledging your anxiety. So all that means is literally just pausing, and you can do this in your head to yourself, and saying, you know what? I'm feeling pretty anxious right now. They don't seem to be getting better. Or this good idea I just suggested, they kind of ignored it. Maybe they thought it was a bad idea. And like, I feel a little bit worried and anxious about that. 
So that's labeling. You're just acknowledging the anxiety. And then after you acknowledge the anxiety, the next thing you want to do, and all this is very brief, remember, you want to validate your anxiety. And to validate your anxiety just means reminding yourself that it's okay to feel anxious. It's normal. It's understandable. You might not like it, but it's okay. So you might say to yourself something like, you know what? I'm feeling anxious um, that my, uh, my best friend isn't getting better with their anxiety. And you know what? That's normal. It's understandable because I care a lot about this person and feeling anxious is uncomfortable, but it's not, it's not bad. It doesn't mean anything's wrong. It's not even a sign that things aren't working, um, but it's just normal to be anxious when someone we care about is suffering or struggling. So again, validation just means to remind yourself that it's valid to feel however you're feeling. And as you get good at this, what's going to happen is the, the sort of the better you are at managing your own emotional baggage, so to speak, the more bandwidth is going to open up for you to be truly present um, with this other person you're trying to support. And when you're really present, when you're really listening and focused on them, right, instead of dealing with your own stuff, what happens is you're going to find a lot, a lot more kind of potential solutions are going to bubble to the surface of your consciousness because you have more awareness. You're not spending lots of mental energy on your own stuff. And so you're going to find that you're going to end up actually being a lot more effective when you get in the habit of, again, managing your own anxiety first before trying to support or help someone else with theirs. Number two, remember that you are responsible to people, but not for them. So in the previous segment, we talked about how our own anxiety is one of the biggest obstacles to being genuinely supportive of people we care about who are struggling with, with anxiety. And one of the reasons we get so anxious supporting people with anxiety is that we're confused. We're a little bit confused about our responsibility, what our responsibility actually is in a situation like this. Specifically, we tend to assume that we are responsible for the outcome for the other person not feeling so anxious. In reality, we are only responsible for what we can control, namely our behavior, what we do, what we say. But again, unfortunately, a lot of us, and this is an easy thing to slip into, we assume that the other person's anxiety is our responsibility. Now, this is problematic for at least a couple reasons. The first is you can't actually control someone else's anxiety. Right? That sounds obvious when you say it out loud, but it's surprising how often we kind of slip into that expectation or belief. And in general, it's just a bad idea to assume responsibility for something that is outside your control. You know, it'd be like uh, thinking you were a bad person if it rained or thinking you uh, weren't working hard enough if your team lost the Super Bowl. <laughs> you don't control these things, right? So it doesn't make any sense to hold yourself accountable for them. But that's often what we end up doing when we have someone we know or love or care about who's struggling with anxiety. We assume their struggle as our own, right? in part because we're sympathetic and we're empathetic. And it's, it's, again, this is a very understandable thing, but it can be very problematic too, because it's not going to work <laughs> long term. And we're just going to end up increasingly frustrated and even resentful because in a sense, we're kind of being judged on something we can't control. And as we get more frustrated and resentful, the less helpful we're going to be to this person with anxiety. The other problem with this kind of taking responsibility for other people's outcomes and their feelings and their anxiety is that ultimately it does them a disservice long term. And the way to think about this is when people struggle with anxiety, especially chronic anxiety, one of the reasons for that is because they have a hard time with agency. That is, they tend to be overly passive a lot of the times and sort of give up agency, not intentionally, but unintentionally. They think things like, um, you know, why, why does this anxiety keep happening to me? Or why can't other people, you know, do things differently so I don't feel so anxious anymore? In other words, they kind of externalize responsibility for their anxiety, when in reality, our emotions are ultimately our responsibility. Just the point about saying all that is you don't want to end up reinforcing unhelpful beliefs in the person you're trying to support with anxiety. Because if you take on responsibility for their anxiety, even kind of unconsciously, you're going to be reinforcing the idea in them that their anxiety is someone else's responsibility or someone else will take care of it. When ultimately, if they're really going to deal with their anxiety long term, they have to take radical responsibility for that anxiety. That is something only they have the means to control and manage ultimately. So practically what this means is you have to get crystal clear about what is actually under your control and therefore something you might be responsible for and what is not under your control and something you care about 
but you really are clear not to hold yourself responsible for. And when it comes to other people and their anxiety, <laughs> that's why I like this little saying of we are responsible to people, but not for people. Because what it implies is we are responsible to people in the sense of what we do, what we say, our behaviors, our actions, those are things we're responsible for. So if you have a child, right, and they get, I don't know, picked on at school, it, you might say that it is your duty or responsibility to um, have a conversation with them and, you know, talk through things with them and give them some support. Those are all actions, things you can do, right? So it does make sense to say that you're responsible for those things. But let's say you have one of those conversations and your kid is still anxious. Is that your fault? No, you did what you could. And there's a million and one reasons why they might still be anxious despite you doing the best possible thing you knew how to do. That's not, you can't control their anxiety. So that's why, that's why I like this phrase, being responsible to people but not for them. It separates out the input side of things, what you can do, your actions, from the output side of things, the effect, how anxious someone feels. You are a, you potentially can be helpful in that equation, but it's not something you ultimately have control over. And you really want to be crystal clear about that and use this little phrase to remind yourself of it. Now, big picture, this is really important because if you are constantly holding yourself to this really unrealistic standard that you are responsible for how anxious your person feels, you are just gonna be constantly frustrated, disappointed, maybe even anxious, because you're not able to control this thing. You're kind of telling yourself you should be able to control in the back of your head uh, because of these expectations. So you're just not gonna be very helpful, either to yourself or your person you're trying to help. On the other hand, when you are crystal clear about where your responsibility starts and ends, your behavior, <laughs> so much of that kind of emotional baggage um, rolls away and you're going to be much freer and more open to being able to be genuinely helpful to the person with anxiety you're trying to support. Number three, less advice, more validation. When people are anxious, what they usually want is more connection and support, not more information and advice. Now, for those of us who are trying to support and help our um, loved ones and people we care about who have anxiety, our tendency often is to kind of skip over all the uh, mushy stuff <laughs> about connection and sport and just go straight to the, the good kind of hard tactical nuts and bolts advice about what we should think they should do. And of course, this is well-intentioned because we want them to quickly and efficiently get over this problem that they're struggling with. So for example, let's say in response to your friend's anxiety about imposter syndrome um, at work, you say, you know, listen, Jay, the board named you CEO because they believe in you and they really think you've got what it takes and you're the best candidate for this job. So stop focusing on what could go wrong and the negatives and start focusing on the positives and what you can do right. Now, some advice like that, that probably sounds pretty uh, typical of a lot of advice. And obviously it's well-intentioned and, and it's probably even true, but the key thing is there, that doesn't mean it's helpful. Just because it's well-intentioned and true doesn't mean it's the most helpful thing you can do. Because here's the thing, even the best advice is worthless if the person you're giving it to isn't ready to hear that advice. And for most people, especially people struggling with chronic anxiety, what they need in order to be able to, be, to receive and actually hear good advice, what they often need is some validation. Now we talked about validation a little bit earlier, but just a refresher, validation means you briefly remind either yourself or someone else that whatever they're feeling, no matter how painful or uncomfortable, it's valid, it's okay, it makes sense. So even though you're feeling anxious and like an imposter, it's okay, it doesn't feel good, it feels lousy, but it doesn't mean anything's wrong, it doesn't mean you're not competent. So just because you feel bad doesn't mean you are bad. Now, a lot of helpers and support people kind of skip right over validation because it almost seems too simple and too obvious, like, yeah, I'm sure they, they know that. They know they're not a terrible person or they know they're not gonna screw up the company. They just feel anxious about it, right? But actually, <laughs> that's not really true. If you think about it, the analogy I like to think about is, as a kid, you may well know that your parents love you, but it's a very different thing to know intellectually that they love you versus to hear them say it to you on a regular basis. That makes a world of difference. And as someone who struggles with anxiety, the same principle I think applies here, which is that they may know that their anxiety is normal, right? Intellectually, they may know that they're not a fraud or an imposter, right? Or that the catastrophic worst case scenario isn't gonna happen, but it still feels that way to them. 
So you can help them get ready to make a better change by validating and reminding them of what they already know intellectually. And when you hear something that, that, that really profoundly important and comforting from someone who really cares about you, it makes a world of difference emotionally, even though it's already something you know intellectually. And just to get a little bit deeper into the why this works, I think it's fascinating and, and helpful to know, one of the things that you may not understand about people who struggle with chronic anxiety is that chronic anxiety itself is, it's a bit of a, what I call a double problem. <laughs> it's a problem in the sense that when you get anxious, it just, it feels bad, which doesn't feel great, right? So that's the first part of anxiety being a problem. It's also a problem because people who are chronically anxious, they tend to get anxious about being anxious. They get anxious about their anxiety. They worry about their anxiety. They catastrophize about their imposter syndrome, stuff like that. So they end up de- what they end up dealing with is this huge amount of anxiety. I think of it as two layers. There's the anxiety and then there's the anxiety about the anxiety. By validating that anxiety, what you do is you tend to help them take off that second layer of anxiety, that being anxious about being anxious because you're validating and normalizing it's okay to be anxious. It's kind of the opposite or like it sort of neutralizes that anxiety about anxiety. And it turns out when you sort of help people remove that second layer of anxiety, the remaining anxiety, while still challenging and uncomfortable, it's a lot easier to deal with when you don't have both layers of anxiety, when it's just a single problem instead of a double problem. So to kind of sum this up, what I would say is there's nothing wrong with giving advice. In fact, giving advice can often be very helpful, but your advice is much more likely to work to land, to be effective, if you've done some validating first. And validating, remember, it's actually very simple and it doesn't have to be very um, involved or time consuming. All it means is reminding them that whatever they're feeling, that anxiety, whatever version of anxiety they're feeling, it's okay, it's valid. So you might say things like, you know, given what you've been through lately, I'd be surprised if you weren't feeling anxious, like it makes tons of sense. Or something like, I know it feels really awful to feel this anxious, um, but that doesn't mean you're you're weak or um, you're not strong. So to kind of sum all this up, remember that when you're talking to anxious people, what you wanna do is validate first before you start giving advice. All you need to know, supporting people with chronic anxiety can be very challenging and very frustrating and very stressful, can even be very anxiety producing. But with a few changes to the way you think about anxiety and how you talk to other people about anxiety, you can really increase your odds of being genuinely helpful and supportive to that person in your life. So remember the three kind of main points we talked about were number one, manage your own anxiety first. Number two, remember that you are responsible to people, but not for people. And number three, remember to validate first and give advice second. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want to learn more about anxiety and how to manage anxiety, either your own or other people's, as well as other topics in emotional health, remember that I write a free weekly newsletter called The Friendly Mind, which goes out every Monday morning, and you are welcome to sign up, and I would love to have you as part of our community.